Um, look, I'll just start quickly with a, a question regarding the Melbourne Metro Rail, um, which I obviously asked this morning of infrastructure investment. But in terms of where the Melbourne Metro Rail is currently sitting in Infrastructure Australia's lists, in your assessment list. So, uh, Philip Davis, CEO, Infrastructure Australia. Um, so, Infrastructure Australia reviewed um, the then Melbourne Metro Rail um, back in 2012, June, June 2012, when it was uh, put onto the infrastructure priority list as uh, real potential. Um, yes, but there's in a statement from the there was a media statement by the minister. Um, on the 8th of October, Minister Truss, who said that um, while projects like the Melbourne Metro, Brisbane Rail and the rail link to Badgerys Creek and around Western Sydney are yet to be planned, have no business case and the costs are unknown, they have not been through any Infrastructure Australia or detailed assessment process. So I wanted to know whether that um, assessment that was done in 2012 and I think published in 2013 is still considered current by Infrastructure Australia. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps if I might okay. add to my answer this morning, Senator, which is that the projects are going through, as, as you heard evidence this morning from my officers, are going through considerable rework. Uh, so I think the view of the Victorian government is that this is a different project in terms of the, the project that was assessed in 2012. There are changes to scope and delivery being contemplated by the Victorian government. Um, so, but where does it still where does it sit then in Infrastructure Australia's priority well, I think, list? I think is it still considered a, a threshold project? Has its status changed? Or? Well, I think it'll have to be resubmitted. So, in in response to the Australian Infrastructure Audit, we're in uh, discussions with each state and territory government, and um, they're submitting to us various initiatives and projects um, for us to consider as part of a refreshed infrastructure priority list. Uh, this may well be uh, a project that we'd be asked to look at it again as part of that process. So, so what's the status then of the previous assessment of it? Um, so that, that's on that's on the record, but but I, I expect there might be some changes to that project which so, would require so, so, us to look at it again. So yeah. until it's looked at again, though, is it still there? You know, standing at the same status yes. as it was before. Yeah. So it's there. So, so the minister's statement saying that it hadn't been yeah. through the Infrastructure Australia process isn't isn't accurate then. Well, no, I think, as I've said earlier, Senator, the project is changing in scope and delivery methodology, therefore it is a different project to the one that was looked at in 2012. The Minister's statement is right. The business case is being developed for, by the State of Victoria for its new project. But that's a different, that's a different view to what Mr Davies has no, just I, said, that, it's, that it's, at the moment the, the old Melbourne Metro assessment is is sitting there on the books, it's still there and it's still a... That's not the project, a, a different project. That's, not the project that's different preceded. project, though, Senator Rice. I mean, well, I think, I think you're, you're verbaling the officials a bit, quite frankly. Um, and M Mr Murdoch has quite clearly said that the, uh, the project has changed, the Victorian government's going through another process. Uh, yes, the old project sits on the books, uh, but uh, the assessment is that it is... Uh, because of some changes, there's a new process that's going to occur. And as Mr Murdoch clearly said, it may be that it gets resubmitted. So uh, I don't think that you can try and tie the two things. So, so given that, how is it being considered then in the development of the infrastructure plan? So uh, in, in response to the audit, we've, we've uh, sought submissions from each state and territory government uh, as part of that process. Each has identified their own priorities, uh, some of which are early thinking around projects, which we're calling initiatives, and then some are actually uh, more fully developed business cases uh, for projects. So that's all part of the mix at the moment, which we're So, so what is the status through. of Melbourne Metro then in the um, communications with the Victorian government to Infrastructure Australia in, in, with relation to the plan? So there's been, been some early discussion around the next iteration of Melbourne Metro, but at this stage we don't have a business case to review. So it's so it's more in the category of an initiative That's rather correct. than a than a specific yeah. um, developed project. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Um, moving on to the um, infrastructure uh, Australian infrastructure plan. Um, so 
at last estimates, we were told that the infrastructure plan would be completed by the end of the year. So where are we currently at with that? So we're, we're still working to uh, completion by the end of the year, uh, subject to consultation. Um, that's, that's our full focus at this time. Right. So, so when you say subject to consultation, so that you'll essentially have a draft that would then be released by the end of the year and then consultation, is that the process? So the, there's, um, there's a number of parts of the plan. Um, first, first part is uh, structured around the challenges we identified in the audit, 10 challenges. So they're, they're uh, the basis of poly, policy reforms and, and commentary. And then the second part is an updated infrastructure priority list, which as you mentioned, has initiatives on it as well as projects. Uh, we're working through all of that at the moment. Uh, that's been a very collaborative uh, engagement with each state and territory government. So we've had um, in the region of 90 meetings with, with our colleagues around the country. We've also had private sector submissions. So we've again had about 90 submissions from the private sector, from uh, industry bodies, associations and so on as well. So we're working through all that detail at the moment. Um, and that will be what, what we uh, bring together and then have further dialogue with uh, states and territories towards the end of the year. So when do you, do, so do you expect, to, are you planning to release a version of the plan that would be open to the public, not just governments and private sector input? No, so what, what, to in, to, for, mm, for, for, for public consultation before a plan is fi the plan is finalised? Um, so the, all, all, the, all the submissions have been at this stage provided on a confidential uh, basis. Uh, hence, hence the close working relationships, um, and that that's that's still behind closed doors discussion mm -hmm. in terms of uh, working through the the final detail of what <clears throat> what we assess through that process as being nationally significant. So when will when will there be something that the public can engage with, and will that be a final version, or will it, will it be a draft version? So that will be a final version. So there will be no public engagement before the finalisation of that plan then? There's, there's no public engagement planned. That's extraordinary. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the private submissions are just are confidential submissions to you, so there's no, there will be no opportunity for people to engage with that plan before it is a final plan? So the, the, pri the private submissions I mentioned, around 90, they've, um, they're not just private submissions, they're regional development, associations, local government, um, most, mo or some of those have been provided on a confidential basis. We're just in the process of going back to those, the, the organisations that made those submissions and we intend to make those public uh, in the near future, fo following confirmation that, that we can do so with the people who submitted them. Um, okay. Um, well, prior to that plan, I want to then go back to the, one of the inputs into that plan, which was your um, the cost-benefit analysis of the assessment framework, which at last estimates we were told would be available um, to, the, to the public within three months, which uh, that was the end of May, so that makes it the end of August, which are now almost two months late. And that assessment was originally due at the, um, by the end of March. So where are we at with the release of that assessment framework? Um, so as, as part of developing the plan, we've also, as you quite rightly uh, mentioned, had a, had a look at the assessment process we use. Um, that, that's been done in um, collaboration again with state and territory governments through the in infrastructure working group, which is a co-op group, um, which in turn has also been updating the transport guidelines. Um, those guidelines are due for uh, release by the end of the year. Um, so the, the update to the framework has very much been done in um, concert with that. As part of that process, we also had a look at the potential for wider economic benefits, which I think I mentioned previously. Um, <clears throat> as part of that process, um, the Bureau of Infrastructure and Transport and Regional Economics is, is looking over the, the medium term to be developing tools uh, in terms of models and data sets to enable us to look at wider economic benefits as a stronger part of our assessment. But at this stage, that's uh, still work that needs to be done to provide those um, data sets. But we, as Infrastructure Australia, we're still keen to encourage proponents to look at wider economic benefits. And so where, where applicable, we're suggesting that we look at um, some of the guidelines used in the UK to support that, that process. But at this stage, it's, it's uh, 
we can't make that a, a kind of key part of the process because we simply don't have the models, unfortunately, or the data to, to do that. So, so the plan, uh, we're just going, again, we're, we're working very closely with the state and territory colleagues on, the, on that process, and we're just going through the final. We've had lots of good input. We're going through the final stages of finalizing that process, which, again, will be released as part of the plan. So the framework will be released as part of the plan. So, but isn't the, the framework was meant to be also have a consultation process around it, not just with the jurisdictions, but also um, wider community consultation. So how can that? And you're saying that the, the plan, there's no opportunity for consultation on the final plan. Um, how how then is the is the wider community, you know, academics, any anybody able to have input into that, you know, key process in in the development of your plan then? If if it's not being released until and until until with the the plan itself. So 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 there's um there's there's two parts to the assessment process. The the first is the, the, the first consideration in making any assessment is around national significance. Uh, and then the second part of the assessment is around, does, does this uh, initiative um, solve a problem, um, a nationally significant problem? And, and this is a clear line of sight to that. And we very much, as part of this new process, very much using the audit, um, the Australian infrastructure audit um, as the baseline for that evidence. Uh, which is where we've been in this very collaborative process with the states and territories because we really we didn't have that kind of data set before so that's been the starting point for this process and then the last part of the process which only really applies to full blown projects with the full business case is looking at the cost benefit analysis and again i mentioned the wider economic benefit part of that but you know that's there's there's little room for kind of improving that part of the process. It's it's well tried and tested. It's um, it's, it's a good process. That the only and the only real change we're looking at there is providing better templates to actually make the process more streamlined and and to try and align it with what everybody's doing around the country. That there's been some feedback around having to fill in different pieces of paper for for the similar purposes in the state and territory government. Um, sometimes several versions there and for ourselves. So we try to st streamline, streamline the process, make the, the templates more uh, user friendly and, and actually present the information that we need to do our assessment uh, in, in a better way. So, so okay, so you're not, not envisaging large, big changes to the cost benefit no. analysis. No. Is, that, is your current methodology for the cost benefit analysis, is that publicly available? Uh, yes, the guidelines are on the website. Okay. So, all right. Um, in general, um, with the the audit, the audit had it's the key um, uh, the, the, the key measure that was being used in the audit was the was um, the direct the development of direct economic contributions as the as as the, the key thing that was being measured. So, can you? I mean, given that. Um, can, can you say how much is the, the assessment of those direct economic contributions in the audits going to influence the assessment of transport priorities in the plan? Um, so, so there are, as you quite rightly say, the, the direct economic contribution was a big part of the audit, but we also, in terms of transport, specifically did uh, some uh, strategic modelling looking at where the, the corridors of, of uh, or where the corridors would be, and particularly in the capital cities where we'd see congestion potentially out to 2031. Uh, that was some modelling done by Veach Lister. It was a similar, or the same approach was used for each capital city. So we have one lens looking at, at, the, at those key corridors. And that's been very much the basis for, uh, one of the evidence bases for looking particularly at the transport space in terms of where, where we feel we need to uh, see, see some clear plans for the future. So that. That's the, been the baseline. But that, that modelling then fed into the direct economic contributions, didn't it? Yes. Yeah, so the, in, in terms of, yeah, maybe and my colleague, Mr. Olchin, is probably a better place to speak about how that was set up. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Davies. Uh, that's correct. We, we 
commissioned two pieces of work, the um, broader um, economic analysis that um, was the, the debt calculations, which was across the four sectors, and then uh, that was supplemented with uh, transport modelling in the six largest capital cities uh, and their, for the very large cities, their, their nearby areas. Those, that modelling gave estimates of um, delay cost and, and economic contribution, not just at a metropolitan wide level, but also in particular corridors. Um, and as uh, Mr Davies was saying, that is one of the pieces of evidence that we're looking at in assessing um, proposals for inclusion in the plan. It's not the only piece of evidence that we're taking. I mean, submissions, both public and jurisdictional, are a part of that. But it is certainly part of the evidence base we're saying. Are proposals coming in that address some of those high priority corridors, for example, in the urban areas that... So, that so if, if something has got a, a high direct economic contribution, that would have a significant influence as to whether it's assessed as a, an That's area that... Yes, something that, that we're certainly looking at that as, needs as a point attention. of evidence for inclusion in the plan. Um, Senator, how much more? 15, on, 16? Yeah, about another five, I'd say. Depends on the, on the response. So let, if you could... Um, how, how important then, how important do you think that it is that the audit and the plan are, are mode neutral as to the p potential contribution from private passenger cars and public transport? So, so the modelling, uh, the transport modelling that we just spoke about, that, that basically looked at the corridor and, and is, um, is taking a neutral view to, you know, what, what are the pressures of the corridor? It's not presupposing what the answer is or what the solution is. And certainly that's, that's the approach we're taking, working with the jurisdiction to say, this is a problem. What, what potential solutions have you got, got to this problem? Okay. So it's a neutral approach. So then how is the plan going to sort of overcome the assumptions that are in the audit that actually overemphasise the importance of passenger travel, um, of car passenger travel versus public transport? There are a number of assumptions that actually, in terms of the direct economic contribution, value um, passenger car travel more highly than a, a journey by public transport. So, I mean, it, it values the time of people who travel by car at twice the, the value as people that travel by public transport, $26 an hour the time of somebody travelling by car compared with $13 an hour for public transport, which means that the direct economic contribution is, is more for that, that car travel. Um, it's the the modelling in it um, presumes low ongoing public transport share because the modelling presumes new road infrastructure but in general not new public transport infrastructure um, how is it going to overcome those those implicit assumptions that are built in the, into the into the audit okay, I might ask uh, mr Olchin to respond again okay. on that one thank you mr Davies. Um, the um, the modelling was done, we believe, on a, on a robust basis um, to account of um, uh, the travel time values for different modes um, that have been discussed, discussed around the industry. In relation to the presumption of um, road projects, um, the only projects that we incorporated into the modelling for 2031 were projects both public transport and road that had um, a f or rather under construction or had a funding commitment, we quite consciously did not include um, any other potential road projects that were not yet um, the subject of financial, um, hard financial undertakings in budgets and things of that nature. Um, but no, the, uh, that's, that, I, I saw the statement that was the case, but when you investigate in fact what projects are included there, in the case of Melbourne East West Link Stage 1 is included in the assumption, in the case of Perth West Connects is there, in the case of, sorry, in the case of Sydney West Connects is there, in the case of Perth Row Highway is there. And again, in terms of public transport in investment, there is no public transport investment in Melbourne other than growth area bus planning. As I say, that was our, our approach to the modelling, um, so as not to prejudge the plan, was only to proceed with or include in the modelling those projects where they were either under construction or where a financial commitment had been made to proceed with the project. We did not make, and, and uh, yes, a number of those projects were road projects, but there were also 
if there were commitments, hard commitments to fund public transport projects, those were also added. Yes, but, but can't you, that, that means that it's not mode neutral in terms of looking forward as to the potential value of public transport compared with roads, because you've essentially got, because the direction has been more investment in, in road projects, that's what's presu presumed in the modelling out to 2031. I, I, um, I don't. I'd have to say, with respect, I don't. I don't agree. I think the uh, we really did um, endeavour just to look at sort of saying beyond the things that we we believe would be financially locked in, as it were. That we're, we're looking forward. Um, everything everything that was open and looking forward was genuinely a case of mode neutral, a mode neutral approach that it's, left it open. It's what it's what's known in in, the, in trend order. Your five minutes is up. Okay. Can I just have one more? You're doing circle work. I'm not doing circle work. Sure? <laughs> um, it's basically past determinism. You were just conti basically it's presuming ongoing ongoing um, patterns that we've already seen. But look, I will move on. Um, the other no, no, area. You've, you've, no, I've got, I've got one more question, please, Chair. Oh, shit. Yeah. Um, other, other things that weren't included in your audit, which then I'm wondering how you're accounting for that, is the direct economic contribution of walking and cycling aren't included, and externalities such as the cost of carbon emissions and noise pollution aren't included in the measurements of direct economic contributions. How is the, the plan accounting for those assumptions? So as, as part of the, the, as we spoke earlier, the, um, the review we do of business cases has, has um, those as part of the review, so we, we look at um, and directly look at the mitigation of, of carbon as part of the cost benefit analysis, but also look look broadly at all modes as part of our um, assessment process. Thank you very much.